Coming up on today's programme, the words they use in hospitals can sound like gibberish to ordinary people. We have a really useful guide to medical jargon. Magazines are fun to read. We show you how they are organised and how to use them to brush up your reading skills. And choosing a book for your children. Some tips on how to get youngsters reading. Medical terms like hematology, orthopaedic and anaphylactic shock. Often they're not very accessible to the layperson. Somewhere you're very likely to encounter medical terms like these though is in a hospital. Even trying to make sense of the signposts in hospital can be difficult. The question is, why do they have to use such difficult language? How are most of us to know that the paediatric department is the department for children or that the orthopaedic unit is the bone unit? Sometimes people can be put off going to hospital simply because they're worried they might get lost. So if you have to go to a hospital yourself, even if it's only as a visitor, here's a really useful guide. Sometimes when you hurt yourself and it's too serious to go to a GP or doctor about, you might need to go along to your local hospital to get checked out. Depending on where you are in the country, you might need to go to different hospitals. If you're injured, you need to make sure the hospital you go to has a casualty department. We're going to Our Lady's Hospital in Cashel County Tipperary. When you arrive at the hospital, you'll usually see a big sign that tells you how to get to the different hospital departments. Even though it might seem like the obvious choice, you don't go to admissions. This is for patients who have an appointment for a pre-arranged stay at the hospital. Since you are looking for the casualty department, you should scan the sign for the word casualty. That way you'll find it a lot quicker than reading every word on the sign. Sometimes the casualty department is called A&E, or Accident and Emergency, so look out for these too. Hospitals make it as easy as they can to find your way to the right place. But if you've hurt yourself and are in a bit of a panic, it can be difficult to work out sometimes. So don't be afraid to ask for directions if you get lost. Excuse me, could you build Timberwood emergency room, please? I'm after having an accident. Yeah, virtually. Thank you very that. much. Hospitals are broken up into lots of different departments. X-ray, physiotherapy, radiology and theatre, for example. But what you're looking for if you've had an accident is casualty. Excuse me, I'm after having an accident. Could you tell me where to go, please? How are you doing there? If you check in at the casualty, stay beside me. They look after All right, thank you very much. When you get to the casualty department, you need to register with the clerical staff. Excuse me, I'm after having an accident. They'll take your details, such as name, address, and the name of your family doctor. There is a charge of 60 euro for admission. You can pay this on the spot, or if you don't have the money on you, you can get a bill that you can pay later. However, if you have a medical card, there is no charge, but you do need to have it with you. Now have you got a medical card? Yeah. Can I just take the number off you, please? Yeah, just a second. You might have to fill out a form Lovely. before the staff in the emergency department look at you. This form will ask you details about your condition. You needn't worry. Everything you put on the form is private, and the hospital won't tell anyone else about it. The next step is when a nurse will examine you to work out how serious your case is. A little bit carefully. Well, when they check in at reception, the nurse in, in charge of triage gets the chart, goes out and calls the patient. When the patient comes in, we generally speak and ask them to sit down, ask them what the problem is, and they need to tell us whether they're allergic to anything, whether they've ever been here before, whether they have uh, any other injuries other than what's apparent. What did you cut it with? I was cutting vegetables and I cut it with a knife. Right, oh, okay. In, in terms of, not an injury like this, but in terms of abdominal pain or something that's not obvious, when a patient comes in, they need to be able to tell us exactly what's going on in the system. Even if it appears to be embarrassing to them, patient confidentiality is number one in the a and &E department. So the patient needs to tell the nurse exactly what's going on. Once the nurse has had a look at you, they will be able to tell you what your treatment will be. We treat the injury and explain to the patient how long they're going to be. Now, if it's a minor injury, like this is a minor injury, we dress it up, get them to wait outside, and then they're recalled again, and the second time they're actually seen by the doctor. It's a good idea to keep track of how long you've been waiting in case someone asks you. Try to remember what time it was when you first talked to the nurse. Linda McCarthy, please. Oh, Linda. Come in, that's it. Yes. So, Linda, uh, your wound was quite superficial. 
When the doctor gets to you, he'll ask you questions and give you treatment. He'll also talk to you about your condition and what you need to do about it. Sometimes medical terminology can be difficult for ordinary people to understand, so you need to make sure that you understand what the doctor tells you. If you're confused, ask him questions. What does elevated mean? What elevated means is you, you'll need to keep your arm up on two pillows at home when, you, when you're asleep. Okay, just keep it raised. So you want me to keep the wound clean and right. get two pillows at night and leave my hand rest on it? That's right. And during the day, do wear the, the, the sling. Wear the sling. Yeah. Keep your wound clean and keep dressing it, okay? And if you have any worries, you're very welcome to come back. Okay, thank you. After you've received treatment, if you're lucky, you'll be sent home. Nobody likes going to hospital, but remember, they want to help you and send you home in good shape. Well, there's also some more information about hospitals in the free workbook that comes with the series. To get your free workbook, you can free phone the number on your screen, 1800 2020 65. That's 1800 2020 65 or visit our website, www.rug.ie. Our guests today are Dr. Cleana Buckley from the Royal College of Surgeons Minimed School that teaches the basics of medicine to people in a 10-week course and Aon O'Reardon, a Dublin County Councillor who's heavily involved in the Right to Read campaign. Welcome along to both of you. Cleana, do you find generally that people are au fait with medical terminology? Are they confident with the use of it? From the hospital perspective, I think it would be true to say that people are acutely aware now of the stress involved when you go to a hospital, either as a patient or visiting patients. You're in a vulnerable position anyway. You're in anyway. a vulnerable position. Yeah. And language should not come in there as an extra barrier. Mm -hmm. So signage in hospitals has improved very dramatically. And I was, for instance, in a children's hospital in the last few days, and I was very impressed because it said that the children's ward was, there was a sign saying with an arrow, giving the direction of the children's ward, but there were little bare feet all along yeah. the wall directing yeah. you to the final bear entering the door of the children's I've seen ward. paw prints on the floor paw as well. Paw prints on the floor. Mm. And I think all that humanises the process, mm -hmm. doesn't it, of finding your way around the hospital if you're a child or if you're an adult. Yeah. Now, from the point of view of actually talking to the doctor then and saying, well, look, what exactly is, is wrong, with me. wrong with me? And the doctor says, well, you have something terribly complicated with, you know, anaphylactic shock, okay. which you mentioned which earlier Which put you in anaphylactic <clears throat> shock. Well, that sounds very complicated and off-putting. And I suppose the doctors now are really being trained from day one in medical schools in the importance of communicating clearly uh, to patients so that the patient understands what the their condition is so that they know perhaps they may have the scientific name but they also understand what it means in layman's language. Aon, do you think your <coughs> constituents, um, Dublin's north inner city, are generally um, au fait and on top of and confident with medical terminology? How are they on health issues talking about them? Well, I think most people in general would be sometimes a little bit intimidated by the terminology that we do mm -hmm. see in hospitals and unfortunately you're, de you're dealing with such a, a crucial um, uh, aspect of our lives and health that you should feel as comfortable as possible to ask any questions that you might feel you, you need to ask. Have you come across um, people who've come to you to say, can you help us in a certain area that we just don't understand the language that's being used? Well, sometimes people will come to their, somebody they're more comfortable with, like their local politician or maybe even their teacher or somebody in the community, You're like both. a priest. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 have, I have both hats. Yeah, but even, even a priest or somebody that is identifiable because sometimes they may feel intimidated by the, by the health a system purely because of the language as you've spoken it is quite intimidating we all find it intimidating and as you say I even learned uh, a few a few terms there earlier that I didn't, re didn't realise uh, uh, added together but um, it, it's something that uh, a scheme like this can, can, can only benefit things and break down those barriers and, and that's, that's what we're all about. In terms of children I suppose on the language that we're talking about and language of health specifically should it start right in primary school should they be taught about health and about nutrition? 
And oh, yeah, well, that, that is done absolutely yeah. right, right, right throughout the, uh, is it, the primary is school working? curriculum. I think, it, I think it is because children feel quite comfortable with telling you what's wrong with them. Uh, <laughs> any, any given, much, given maybe. Well, you know, any, any given opportunity, yeah. they, they tend to tell you that there, there's something wrong with them. But there's, um, if there is something wrong, and that, 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 that's good. It's good that the children will feel comfortable with their teacher and with their environment so that they can express themselves. Mm -hmm. But certainly um, that language uh, can, is introduced right, right throughout the, the yeah. school curriculum, and that's a good thing. You've brought in a book with you. Um, I have. Room to read, and it's part of the Right to Read campaign. Can you tell us about that? How it worked? Well, the Right to Read campaign is something I initiated as as Deputy Lord Mayor of Dublin, which I am this year, and it's essentially looking at the issue of, of educational disadvantage, which I feel quite passionately about. And we know that one in three children who live in disadvantaged areas uh, have very um, uh, major problems, uh, very basic reading problems, for a variety of reasons. And uh, my point is that, OK, obviously the school is, has a massive role to play in that, but that the uh, local authority has a massive role to play in that as well. En encouraging reading. Well, encouraging in terms of the, 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 housing, uh, the, the housing standards that we have, uh, do all, all our children have the basic uh, provisions in terms of space to do their homework in? Uh, are our libraries open long enough? Uh, and within those libraries, do we have the services that children can access to do homework and to be engaged in re reading clubs? And when we did the research, we discovered that actually uh, in a lot of libraries weren't open, and the nearest library to us in Sheriff Street didn't open on a Saturday. Uh, when libraries, the kids are free. Uh, well, the ki well, when the kids are free and didn't open after five o'clock, there's other libraries across the city in, uh, very similar to that. So we. Uh, Launched a campaign. We got we talked to the city manager about it, and he was agreeable to invest a, a sum of one million euros into the, into the library system, which will uh, in, improve the opening hours. Which now, so now all libraries in Dublin City will be open six days a week. It will improve the uh, technology in terms of Wi-Fi and uh, internet uh, accessibility. Obviously, a very proactive um, politician, and another of your very good ideas was the buy a book for children at Christmas. One did it work? Yeah, I got good, I got, I got good feedback on that because I think children, in, in fairness to, to children, I think uh, most parents would realise this, they I instinctively are attracted to books yes. and, and, and they do enjoy uh, uh, reading and they enjoy the whole uh, the discovery of turning a page and finding something new. Mm -hmm. So I think when you encourage a child to, to, uh, to read a book or encourage a parent to buy a book, I mean, sometimes they, the, the parents can be... Uh, attracted themselves by the toys or the flashy knobs and that are on, yeah. on, on toys and all that kind of thing and assume that, that, that the children will be in, intrigued by that. Sometimes a simple book will, be, will keep a child as happy. Exactly, uh, and will uh, last longer. Toy. Will last longer and just to encourage parents to, to, to realise that and it actually, I think, made a bit of an impact. Well, what about the children in your life? Whether you have your own kids, grandchildren, nieces or nephews, how do we get them to learn to love reading?